My name is Keo Reese. I'm at Rutherford County Master Gardener. I'm here with three of my fellow Master Gardeners. I'm going to do most of the talking because that's my only skill. They're going to chime in and my, hopefully my audience will chime in simultaneously to give uh, information on landscaping for wildlife. Some of our topic will be landscaping to attract wildlife. Some of our topic will be landscaping to deter wildlife. Um, and we'll get started right now. Wildlife needs the same stuff as every other living creature. Food, shelter, water, space. This picture is of Butchart, Butchart Gardens. Um, it was my information that people that go to Alaska on the cruises will stop there sometimes. That's what we did. Okay. Yeah, someday, someday I'll make it. Maybe, I don't know, but someday. Wildlife really prefers native plants and native plants are best for wildlife. The reason for that is native plants, the plants that typically grow in an area and have not been imported from anywhere else and wildlife have evolved together over time. And I'm not just talking the last 10 years, I'm talking the last 10,000 years. Your hummingbirds that had the right size beak and got the nectar out of a particular plant simultaneously transported that pollen to another plant, giving that plant a pref a, a, an advantage in setting seeds and developing more plants that were going to be suitable to that particular hummingbird with the longer beak. This is just an example. Simultaneously, the hummingbird with the longer beak, who's causing the plants with l deeper flowers to grow, got extra nectar. So they're going to have more successful uh, sets of babies, more successful mating more successful offspring and those offspring are going to be more likely to have a longer beak. That's the kind of thing we're looking at. So this hummingbird is giving an advantage to this particular type of flower. That flower in return is giving an advantage to that particular type of hummingbird. So plants and animals evolve together. Do you see what I mean? Look a little quizzical? Digest it and, and holler back at me later in the thing. Um, but th that's, that's a real thing. Um, so native wildlife, especially birds, butterflies, and pollinators and other organisms evolved with the plants here. Many can only feed on plants they co-evolved with. Native plants are not invasive. So they have enough adversaries or competitors in the, in the native environment to limit their being invasive. So you won't get like periwinkles invasive, ivy is invasive. Those were both imported into this area. You, you won't get invasive mimosa. A lot of plants from China have no predators in this environment. That's why they go crazy. Kudzu, classic example. There's nothing on, well, I don't even know if goats eat kudzu. Goats will eat everything, but I don't know that they'll eat kudzu. I don't know. You'd think that they would, but it doesn't look like it. I, yeah, if, if I was a goat keeper, I think I'd be looking for patches of kudzu to take my goats to. Yeah. So, Native plants are not invasive. Mimosas are invasive. I have personal anecdote, and this is not scientific and it's not sponsored by uh, the Ag Center, uh, University of Tennessee, but I have a neighbor who loves mimosa trees. And they are pretty, they're gorgeous. And he's got them planted all the way along his road and I pull, I pull mimosa weed after mimosa weed and I'd never say a word to that man about his mimosas because he loves those mimosas so I'll, he's the best neighbor on earth I'll just keep pulling them mimosas. Um, so the point is native plants aren't invasive and those are the ones that are going to be best for your um, wildlife that you want. Butterfly garden. To invite butterflies to your garden you'll first need to understand their life cycle. Butterflies have four stages. They have 
egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, and winged adult. You have to accommodate the needs of each stage for the greatest success in your butterfly garden. So if you have a monarch, you're going to have to have food that the monarch likes to consume. After they've consumed that food for a little while, uh, they're going to lay their eggs on the plants that they like to consume, which are typically your dill, your fennel, um, your butterfly weed. And there's a lot of different butterfly weeds. There's not just the one uh, which has the little orange flowers. There's also the ones that you see in the farmer's field that grow where they don't do anything out in the field. You'll see tall plants coming up that have um, opposite leaves. Typically, they're large leaves, about this big. The plant gets about this tall, has a white flower on the top of it. That's also a but uh, in the butterfly weed family. And those are food for butterflies. Milkweed. It, yeah, milkweed. Um, the butterfly will lay, lay their eggs. They'll consume the pollen and the nectar from those plants. They'll lay their eggs on those plants. The eggs will hatch, turn into little worms, then bigger worms, and they'll consume the plant. And they'll alternate between species that I just mentioned, dill, fennel, um, some stuff in the, uh, like Queen Anne's Lace. I'm not saying Queen Anne's Lace, but similar plants. They'll eat that, they'll lay their eggs, the larva will crawl around eating all that stuff and eventually it'll get to the pupa stage. When it gets to the pupa stage, it will form a little brown sac around itself and be hanging on there and you'll see it. Eventually, it will hatch as a butterfly. The butterfly will typically start the whole process over again in the same area with the same plants or they'll migrate if it's a migrating butterfly. And I, off the top of my head, the only one I can tell you that migrates is your monarch. Oh, another thing that butterflies need if you're putting in a butterfly garden, uh, the males especially need a puddling pond. That's where you have a little pile of rocks or a real shallow something with water in it so they can tuck in and get water. You can also put um, fresh uh, fruit that's got juices, like um, they love cantaloupe, they love uh, honeydew, they love watermelon, a real juicy fresh fruit. So they get, they get a little carbohydrate, they get a little liquid, so then they go on about their business, then they come back. They get a little carbohydrate, they get a little liquid, they go on about their business. <coughs> okay, another way to attract hummingbird or uh, butterflies and other insects, reduce the amount of lawn. Uh, low wildlife value, time and money intensive. Uh, there's a lot of money, a lot of time that goes into um, doing a lawn. They have high water uh, requirements and high nutrient requirements. Um, but if that's what you want to do with your time, you go right ahead. <laughs> Vertical layering. This is a big deal when you're attracting wildlife, especially butterflies and small critters. Horizontal layering is when you have a layer of plants that's very low to the ground. Uh, it's, a, it's a buffer. And it gives the critters that are running through your yard shelter, or flying through your yard, whatever, shelter and food in the form of nectar, uh, leaves, berries, nectar, and pollen. And then that critter can move through there and have shelter as they're going to the next level, which you have a little higher level of plant material. It could be woody or not. It can be your uh, typical of like your, your irises, about that height, your peonies, your um, things that are fleshy, not quite woody. Then you go back to, then you have your next layer, which is a little bit higher. This is providing shelter, food, water, for these critters that are going all the way up, all the way until you get to your trees. So uh, replacing lawn with this buffer type area gives the wildlife in your area a place to go. Make sense? Okay. The plant masses should vary in depth along with height. So you have, a, this one, you have one this wide, then you have one this wide, then you have one this wide, and then you get your trees and they're way wide. Um, and it provides food and shelter for your wildlife in your garden landscape. This is just an idea. I know a lot of people have small yards and can't do something like this, but 
this helps. If you look in nature, if you go out into the country and you look where they're, they're mowing fields, but you look at the edge of that field, you'll see that typically there's a low, a medium, high, and a way high. If you go to a, uh, if you go to a jungle, if you go to a tropical area, you'll see as you're driving down the road on your, through Florida, you'll see a low, a medium, and a high. They didn't intend for that to be a shelter area for those critters, but it is. Um, they're gonna, those plants will grow with the availability of sunlight. And, and it, it just, it always looks like that. And then when you get into a forest, there's no plants at the bottom. It's all big trees. So that's just way to one way to accommodate more wildlife. Now I would personally pursue, prefer to accommodate less wildlife this way because that way the, the bobcats coming through the woods are not going to eat my chickens because, <laughs> because I can see them coming. They're not comfortable being out in the open. And if I cut all that brush down, they're in the open and they, they don't like that. So that's on my list for this winter. Food sources for butterfly larvae. Aster plant, tons of asters. Most, these will all probably most likely bloom or produce berries or leaves for wildlife at different times. Cherry laurel, black cherry, wild plum, tiger swallowtail. Clover, um, that's all your, your yellow clovers, your white clovers, your purple clovers. Sulfur and gray hair streak. I don't know what a lot of these butterflies look like, guys. I mean, I'm not a butterfly expert by any stretch. If y'all want to get a butterfly person in here, we'll, we'll, we'll do that for you. Um, dill, carrot, parsley, fennel, queen anne's lace, black swallowtail, which is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the state uh, butterfly for the state of Tennessee. Uh, dogwood, you have your dogwood uh, flowers producing pollen and nectar in the spring, and then you have the little red berries that they produce in the fall. Um, spring azure, elm, and willow, morning cloak, viceroy, and question mark. That's not a question mark as in we don't know. That's the name of the butterfly. Hackberry is food for your hackberry butterfly. Milkweed, all the Asclepia species, that's your swamp milkweed and your out in the middle of the field milkweed and your butterfly weed, which is the orange one that grows. Those are all monarchs. Tip, uh, and by the way, milkweeds are notoriously difficult to transplant. So if you do get some from a nursery, try to get one small so that it's, there's easier transplant shock. It's that um, when you plant them, if you put them on a heat mat uh -huh. or a heat pad, it doesn't have to be a heat mat, it can be a heat pad. They, a lot of plants like temperature around 70 degrees okay. to germinate. Yeah, uh, the best way to test your germination rate is to take your seeds, put them in a paper towel, moist the paper towel, stick them someplace hot, and then a lot of times if you catch them in time before they've actually, before the root has invaded the paper towel or gotten too far along, you can take those that you have germinated and put them in soil mm -hmm. to continue to grow. It just gives you a, it just gives you a, a you know, a, a little advanced step, just a little one. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that I have any butterfly seeds at the present time because I, uh, I the only plants I had the roofers killed. <laughs> it's all right. They they evidently needed to go, and I evidently needed to go get new ones. Um, but yeah, yeah. But they are. They're tough to transplant for sure. They have a long tap root, and that tap root doesn't like being jerked out of the soil. So if you get them growing. Don't let them get way big before you transplant them because they're not going to like it. Um, and if you buy them, see if you can find little ones because they'll be easier to transplant for you. There's a really nice plant sale in the spring at the Lebanon's, Cedars of Lebanon State Park. It's done by the native plant people and uh, most of their stuff is in little, little bitty containers. It's like regular people started the plants. It's not like it was done on a commercial basis. I'm not saying that commercial is bad or anybody else, but it's just that these plants will be smaller. And it's a great plant sale and tons of fun. LC Quartermain uh, plant sale. 
it's part of the L.C. Quartermain Festival at the State Park at Lewis, in, yeah, Cedars of Lebanon State Park. She was a professor at MTSU. She did a lot of research on um, cedar glades and the critters that in, and the plants and the crit, subsequently the critters that inhabit cedar glades. Food sources for butterfly larvae: uh, more mustard family, cabbage and checkered white. So mustard family would be a lot of the plants that are also cabbage. Native grasses. That's a lot of your blue stems. Um, various skippers, oak species, banded hair streak, passion flower, gulf fritillary, and zebra longwing. The little orange, I do know this, the little orange butterfly that you're seeing all over the place right now, that's the gulf fritillary. And it will go after several different plants, but it loves your passion flower. So, um, and passion flower is edible if you all want to try it. I ate it, I didn't die. <laughs> I think. A uh, pawpaw typically grows near stream banks that likes a little moist, likes a little shade too. Zebra swallowtail. Pearly everlasting, and I don't know what that butterfly looks like. Um, oh, pearly ever. I'm not sure about that one at all. American painted lady. Pipe vine, which is another big native plant. It's a good looking native plant, but I haven't gotten it to successfully grow yet. So I can only tell you what it looks like when it's in the pot. Um, pipe vine swallowtail. Plantain, you, your yard, if you don't weed or put down uh, weed killer in your yard and the ground compacts it all, you'll see a lot of plantain. That's the ancestor for the hosta that we grow for looks now, but typically the plantain. And a lot of people swear that the plantain has medicinal properties. I don't know. Um, but I do know that if the ground's compacted, you'll, get, you'll see big swaths of plantain because my yard's compacted and I have big swaths of plantain. Um, sassafras, that's the tree that puts the leaves out that look like a mitten with one thumb sticking off of it. Uh, and that's the buckeye butterfly. Sa um, senna and coffee weed, not familiar with them, don't know how, what to tell you to look for. Cloudless giant sulfur butterfly. You know, a lot of these butterflies may be up here in the tops of these trees and you're not seeing them. Spice bush. It's a great little tree. Really nice. Grows at the edge of an area. Um, it, it, it's a very attractive tree. It's a native tree. Um, spice bush swallowtail. Tulip tree. Big old tree. You probably want a tulip tree for your um, bees because it's the f one, yeah, one of the first trees to come out in the spring mm -hmm. producing tons of nectar and pollen for those bees. Hummingbirds. The ruby-throated hummingbird is only three to four inches long, weighs less than 0.2 ounces. Each fall it migrates from the eastern United States to Mexico and Central America. Hummingbirds get nectar from plants and plants get pollinated by hummingbirds. Hummingbirds fly south starting in September. I have not noticed any lessening of the number of hummingbirds yet. I don't know if y'all have or not. You know. Yeah. Maybe yours got so, when they reach a certain weight, whatever's required for them to make the trip, then they take off. So I'm trying to, to feed them, you know. The secret to feeding them is to make sure you put in the, the, the juice that's uh, one part sugar for every three parts water. It's a mixture of, it's four parts, so it's three to one. Um, and make sure that you change it every three to four days. Never let it get cloudy. If it gets cloudy, then there's usually a fungus growing in it that can sicken the hummingbird. So uh, dump it. They're amazing, and if they fly across the Gulf without ever stop, without ever stopping. Pound for pound, the meanest animal on the planet <laughs> is sitting right there ahead of you. But I love to watch them. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Bluebirds. Bluebirds nest in natural cavities and nest boxes. Animals like bluebirds are why you want to keep a dead tree in your yard with holes in it. Uh, eventually, the tree comes down, and it's always ugly, but. Bluebirds and other critters like to nest in cavities. And when we keep a clean, you know, our definition of clean landscape, we're doing away with what these guys need to survive. So you can put bluebird boxes up if you want. Uh, bluebirds, there's instructions and bluebird societies on the internet. 
the, the, the bird that will live in this space, in this box, is determined by the size of the hole. The bluebird will only live in a, in a hole, in a space, that's got a hole a certain size. That's so other birds can't get in and take the space before they do. That's also so they can protect that space from other predators like snakes and raccoons and possums and stuff like that. So, and uh, other critters have made the holes bigger on the ones I got, but I need to go in and take like a metal plate or something and put it over that so the bird can go in and out with just its size. There's also grates that you can put over the top of them that will allow the bluebird to go through, but not, and those are on the website. I have a friend that was one of the, she was really into bluebirds and did all that, all the stuff online. Um, we have the bluebirds in this area will overwinter, so if you if you want to, you could put continue to put out food for them. They love uh, fro freeze dried mealworms or live mealworms, whatever your heart desires. But again, bluebirds overwinter here. Um, they like fields. Does it necessarily have to be completely empty? It can be filled with grasses, but they do like an open expanse to scoop up their their bugs. You know, that's that's where they like to live. Um, they like, now I've seen contrary things about the weather type roosting sites. Because at one point uh, um, I had seen bluebird houses that had a hole in the top and the, the guy who made it said that they don't mind getting rained on. So you're going to find all kinds of information. Y'all, good luck. Um, but they are fantastic. Songbirds. Most birds feed on insects, seeds, fruits, and berries. Those that don't migrate feed on fruit and seeds in winter. This is one of the reasons that it's not necessary to clean up your garden, flower garden space in the, in the fall. One of the main reasons is a lot of plants, perennials, grow on stems that are hollow. <coughs> and the preferred <coughs> egg laying site for a lot of insects is round, little round spaces. A lot of your native bees, little round spaces. So if you clean that all up and burn it or clean that all up and, and take it to the dump, you've removed all those little insects that would have, those are beneficial insects, and they would be in there just waiting to pop out come springtime uh, of next year. Now if you cut all those stems because you can't stand how ugly they are and you put them over to the side, you may very well s still get them those insects to pop out and come and help you in your garden next year. If you love the lawn and you leave the leaves on the lawn, it will kill it. Lawn is a very, it's a very needy plant. You have to give it exactly what it needs or it will die. And a lot of birds and insects, like butterflies, eat one thing in the spring and then another thing in the fall. Um, or closer to whenever they migrate or whenever they, you go into winter. So they, they don't eat just one thing. Like, um, what was it? Hummingbirds. Hummingbirds consume a little bit of nectar in the spring. They primarily focus on insects because they need a higher protein content because they're trying to raise young. And as they raise successive uh, hatches of young, they're going to need nectar, protein, nectar, protein. And, and there's not just one or the other either. It will overlap. So when you think that you're the only source of food for these poor birds, and you've got to get your, bird, butterf your uh, hummingbird feeders out, that's not necessarily the case. They'll be OK. And they also like the trumpet vines, which is a native vine that you don't see a whole lot because the plant itself is down on the ground. You know, that you see a strand running up the side of a tree. You got to notice that you've got great big tr little trumpets up there. You got to look way up and you'll see, oh, there's orange trumpets up there. So, not all one food for everything. Bunnies, rabbits. I talked to a wildlife specialist uh, from the university, or not from the university, from uh, Tennessee, the Tennessee wildlife thing. And she told me that the best way to uh, get wildlife, to take care of wildlife in your yard or in your, wherever you're at, is to not mow the whole thing until August. Now I can do that because I, I don't have a HOA. <laughs> um, because creatures like this, they burrow a little spot out and they pull tufts of fur off of themselves and they line that little hole. 
They, they excavate a little hole. They lay their, uh, they deliver, not lay, they deliver their young into that spot. And then they only come back once a day to feed those critters. The reason being, in my mind, that they only come back once a day is they don't want to draw predators in and, and let those predators know that that, that defenseless baby is there. Um, so that's how they do it. And other critters do the same thing. They may come back more often than once a day, but the, if you don't mow an area that you don't have to necessarily, um, these critters are in there. I, you know, and then come fall, when you mow it to get it down, you'll see all kinds of stuff running out of it, like mice and rats and you know, uh, rodents. But bunnies are the big one. And they'll be in your flower beds too. And your garden. And your garden. Yeah, and watch, because you'll step in the hole and you'll hurt yourself. If you see a, b a baby bunny running around, it's okay. You don't have to try to do anything. If you can find the original nest, if you want to find the original nest, you can put it back in there. The mama will come looking for it. But if you don't, because uh, from what I understand, uh, babies are weaned at three weeks, full grown at seven weeks. And buddies are everywhere. You see them everywhere. It's not country. It's not suburbs. It's not city. It's everywhere. Mowing pasture. Delaying the mowing of expanses of pasture allows small animals to nest and raise their young. At the end of the season, the pasture can be mowed. The young will have left the, the nest that's supposed to be nest, guys, by that time. Squirrels and chipmunks. Squirrels are omnivores. They're going to eat anything that they can, including your plastic pots. Um, they like to eat plants and meat. Squirrels mainly eat fungi, seeds, nuts, and fruits, but they will also munch on eggs, small insects, caterpillars, small animals, and even young snakes. Squirrels' front teeth constantly grow. If they don't chew on something to file them down, they'll, they'll come right through. And they will eat garden plants such as tulips, freesia, and other bulbs. Typically, when you see a daffodil growing out in the middle of the highway median, that means a squirrel dug it up to eat it, decided that it was unpalatable, carried it someplace to hide it, and put it in the ground. <laughs> Which, we got to give them credit, they've planted flowers all over. But if you plant edible plants, that's a squirrel buffet. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. It's an annual. Just say, this is an annual. <laughs> or put something over the top that they can't get to it. Whatever you prefer. But if you plant tulips, good luck. Um, if you plant freesia, good luck. Deer. Oh, here we are. Deer eat berries, fruits, leaves, and shrubs. Now, in my experience, deer will eat anything growing. They don't eat meat, but they'll eat anything growing, dependent upon how hungry they are. And there's nothing sadder than seeing a skeletal deer foraging in the wintertime. Um, and I'm not a, I don't love deer. I don't, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a deer hugger. Um, but the annuals in your garden that are resistant to deer include lantana, which is um, poisonous, marigold, which I can only imagine it's, they don't eat it because it's too pungent for them. And by the time they're really hungry in the winter time, they're gone. Uh, Canis, lily of the valley, which is also uh, poisonous. Painted tongues, not familiar why they wouldn't eat those. Heliotropes, terenia, begonias, and Persian shields. I don't know why they don't eat those. A couple of those are tropicals. I can't. Oh, it's my experience that they'll eat anything. Um, um, most toxic plants are resistant to being eaten by deer. I also have hellebores in the yard. They haven't touched them, and hellebores are toxic. Uh, but my costas that I planted are gone, and they're never coming back because I'm tired of planting a buffet for critters. <laughs> Foxes. Foxes flourish in urban and country settings. They're just like coyotes. They're there, no matter whether you see them or not. Rest assured that they are there. Um, they're omnivores. They're cute, too. Doggone it. Yeah. Um, they have a lifespan of 10 to 14 years. They're very shy. 
one litter per year, and they're related to dogs, not cats, though they do pounce on their prey. So if you ever see them going after their prey and they pounce and you think it's similar to a cat, it, it, they're really mo more like a dog. Um, but, and they'll eat your plants as well as any critters running through your yard, so be aware. Bobcats. They're carnivores and will consume a wide variety of insects, reptiles, amphibians, fish, birds, and mammals. Rabbits, and in northern latitudes, white-tailed deer are important components of the bobcat's diet. I, the deer that I've seen, I don't know a bobcat could bring them down because bobcats really aren't that big. But um, bobcats will come in your yard and get small animals. They'll get your cats. They'll get your dogs um, if they're small enough and they don't put up enough of a fuss. Um, bobcats will peruse the area from 30 to 60 feet away and stay undercover until they think it's safe enough to, to head in and grab what they want and then turn around and head out. We watched one come in the yard one day, pick up a chicken and turn around and run and my daughter ran after it. And I said, dear, what are you gonna do if you catch it? <laughs> we didn't get that chicken back and that's okay. I'm pretty sure it was dead already. Um, but they are pretty, bobcats are pretty and I don't mind growing a chicken occasionally for them, but Coyotes, they're everywhere. Don't think they're not. Um, they're smart, they're sneaky. The worst ones are the ones that have interbred with dogs. So they're not only smart and sneaky and wild, but they're not afraid of humans. So just be on the safe side. Again, watch your dogs, watch your cats. Uh, when I lived out west, and again, this is personal anecdote, but we had, a coyote take a dog off a leash that was being walked. Wow. Yeah. Um, they feed on everything, frogs, fish, rodents, snakes, plants, and berries. And again, they're good looking, you know? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you lost your habitat. And I'm seeing more and more of them on the side of the road every day for, uh, after being hit. Raccoons, typically not predated upon, though upon occasion cougars, bobcats, and coyotes will attack them. When their paws are wet, they become more sensitive. That's why they wash their food. Uh, omnivor omnivorous eats plants, insects, and small creatures. I was warned at one time, again, anecdote, I was warned by a vet that 99% of the raccoons he had come in contact with were rabid. Now this was in Virginia next to a swamp. So I don't know if that's still the case here. It may be different if dependent upon where, where you live here. Mice, voles, and moles. They eat insects and plants. Here's how it works. The mole runs through the surface of the soil, digging a little tunnel. The mole is pursuing um, usually a larva form of some insect, a grub, um, a wor an earthworm, they will eat They eat the creepy crawly things. Moles do not eat plants. They make the tunnel. The vole, which is a mouse without a tail, also called a shrew, utilizes their little tunnel, crawls through their tunnel, but it utilizes their tunnel to get to your garden plants, especially ones that have tasty roots. That would be anything that's a root crop or a hosta or anything else that they think is tasty. I have known people to pull, see their plants moving, pull the plant up out of the ground and have a vole chewing on the roots. And they're holding it up and there's this little vole going. And on a good note, another animal that uses their tunnels are snakes. Snakes eat mice and voles. Another way to get rid of voles that are utili utilizing the mole's tunnels is to take a five gallon bucket, get a mouse trap, bait the mouse trap with peanut butter, put the mouse trap next to the hole that the mole and the vole and the mice are using, put the five gallon bucket over the top, upside down, put a rock on top of it. The vole will come out of the tunnel, they'll see the trap they'll go to eat the peanut butter. Snap. I knew a woman that caught 139 voles one summer using this method. 
Now, she didn't catch any moles, only voles, because the moles weren't interested in her bait. I don't know what to tell you to do about the mole tunnels. If you're worried about mole tunnels and you're worried about the damage they're doing to the yard, and it's not only just the way it looks, but you can step into a mole tunnel and really and hurt yourself. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you about the moles, it, but you can get rid of the voles. Smart yards. I'm not going to cover this in depth, but Tennessee, uh, uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, TennesseeYards.utk.edu has a program, Tennessee Smart Yards. It's an extension-led program that guides Tennesseans on practices they can apply in their outdoor spaces to create healthier, more ecologically sound landscapes and communities. The nine principles of the stewardship serve as the foundation of the program and are explored in online modules. And I think you get a certificate if you complete the whole thing. You like fill out, you know, click the boxes. And I think you get a certificate. I, that kind of sounds like fun, but, um, and I don't know about you, but the word that really catches my eye in this is the nine principles of stewardship. To, to be a steward of an outdoor space is, is kind of cool. It, you know, it makes my little heartstrings go uh, th thrum a little bit. I mean, I can't tell a worm how to act. You know, no matter if I call this my yard or not, that worms, he's going to do what he wants to do. <laughs> okay, here's some shrubs and other plants to plant for a landscape healthy or a, a wildlife healthy yard. Azalea, Bodleia, that's your um, butterfly bush. Sumac, that's the plant that you'll see pretty soon uh, going bright red and with these. Uh, clumps of orangey things hanging down on the side of the road along the fence lines. Vaccinium species, those are blueberries. Viburnum, viburnums have the best scent in the world in the springtime. Uh, Viburnum davidii and Viburnum something else. But you'll never smell a better smell um, than a Viburnum in the springtime. I know, I'm prejudiced. Abelia, uh, lantana, again, that's poisonous. But evidently they're getting nectar and um, uh, pollen from it. And again, I've had lantana over winter, so as as the as the temperature is is stays warmer, lantana is more likely to survive from year to year. Uh, annuals, alyssum, candy tuft. That's your ibaris. Um, alyssum is your low, and if you did a, a row of plants, the different rows of plants, alyssum would be the low one. Candy tough would be a low one. Cosmos is about three foot tall. Uh, white, pink, red, yellow. Gallardia, that's what you see when you go to the, ocean, to the ocean and it's grown in extremely sandy soil. So it will tolerate a, a wide range of um, growing conditions. It will tolerate sand, it'll tolerate salt. Uh, I don't look for you to have salt in your yard, but you, will ha you might have some sand. Impatience, uh, marigold, scabiosa, that's that pretty little plant that uh, it looks like it has a pin cushion in the middle of it. Uh, verbena. Uh, we again, verbena will if it's the homestead verbena, which is the purple one, it will overwinter. Um, the other ones not so much, and uh, you have white, pink, purple. There might even be a variegated uh, verbena, but I'm not positive, so don't hold me to that. Uh, Pansy, viola, panola, variable, f fall to spring. These will be some of your first blooming plants, wild and cultivated in the spring. Uh, the viola is teeny tiny, teeny tiny flower. Viola trifoliate, it's got three uh, leaves on the, on the bloom. Um, pentas, pink, purple, white, red, great uh, plant for the summer. Uh, it tolerates a little bit of drought, surprisingly enough, and tolerates a little bit of shade. Um, perennials, your aster, they'll be coming on now. There's your white, lavender, and yellow asters. Bee balm. Uh, bee balm's three foot tall. It will grow in wet areas. Uh, it comes in a pink, a hot pink, a red, and a purple, if I'm not mistaken. Hummingbirds and bees love it. They'll go after it. If you plant it outside your window, you'll get a, a constant show 
of hummingbirds and bees going, uh, going all over those plants. Butterfly weed, those are all your butterfly weeds, milkweeds, uh, orange, pink, red, yellow. I think there's a white. Uh, salvias, variable, cat mint. That is a mint that's got a beautiful little blue flower along the spikes, the flower spikes. It blooms all summer long. Um, it forms a mounded habitat about this big. It is not um, the same as the other mints, though the name is cat mint. It, it is in the mint family, however. Did that make any sense at all? Probably not. Um, phlox. I, my phlox is still blooming. There is still phlox blooming out there all by itself, just big old clumps of phlox. Pink, lavender, and white. The lavender seems to do the best. Um, primrose, which is a great plant, blooms in the spring, likes a little bit of shade. Purple coneflower, state flower of Tennessee. Uh, we have the Tennessee flower, which has a notched uh, flower petal. The, it's a very thin petal on the flower, and the tip of it is notched. You can see the uh, coneflowers and flowers like it in the Couchville um, glades. In, in the state park at Cedars of Lebanon, they have the native plants, but the Couchville Glades has the um, um, cedar glade plants, which this is the only area in the world that we know of. These plants are specifically here because we, this is the only place that has these exact growing conditions, which I, uh, referenced earlier the Elsie Main quarter uh, Elsie quarter main festival she studied cedar glades and the plants that grow in them and there's you only find them Rutherford County Wilson County and what's the county next to us Davidson County it's this area we are special we're really special you guys a lot of sedums oh again there's sedum right there sedum spectabil Pink, late summer, that's the one that uh, grows out in the fields that you see. You, a lot of times it's grown on top of rock. Uh, bone set, I have no idea what that plant is. Does anybody else? Sounds like something that should be in a soup. Um, but uh, black-eyed Susan, that's a broad category of plants. I'm going to assume that they mean all the rudbeckias, which that's a huge, there's huge black-eyed Susan numbers out there. Blazing star, that's your liatris or your gay feather. Um, it's always purple, it's always a spike. If it grows in a suitable condition, it, it can get as tall as five or six feet. Um, it is a great plant, the butterflies love it. Dandelion, y'all know how great that is. My grandmother made dandelion wine. Um, goldenrod, we'll be seeing a ton of that now. Uh, most people, when they reference goldenrod as an allergen, are not talking about goldenrod. They're just talking about another plant that blooms at the same time. Most people are not allergic to goldenrod. They're allergic to ragweed. So, uh, Joe pieweed. There's different cultivars of Joe pieweed. They go from itty bitty round like this big to whoo. Um, it usually has a pink flower on the top of it that's kind of feathery looking. Um, that is a great wildlife plant, super wildlife plant. Yarrow, that's a shorter plant, about this big, white, yellow. And here's the references. Questions? Okay, I thank you. I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you take your day to come here and listen to me. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much.